Okay. Right, we are recording. So folks, we do a few reminders before we kick off each call. Um, so first of all, this is week 11 of the 16 weeks of training that OLS has been running. And we're delighted to have you all here, whether you're joining today live or you're watching on YouTube later. Um, we have a few reminders. This call is recorded. This call is also being transcribed. So if you're watching in real time, you can click on the top where it says Otter AI, click here to open live transcript. Um, and it will be automatically transcribing the words that I'm speaking or that anyone in the main room speaks. Um, we also recently have experimented with adding live translation. Um, so if you want to play with the Zoom options and look at captions, you might be able to see if it can translate into your language. Um, if it's ridiculous, feel free to laugh at it and turn it off. Um, it's not something that I've tried before. Uh, so, But uh, we'd love to hear your feedback about how that's working as well. Um, when we're in breakout rooms, we don't normally have live transcription. So what we say is we offer two options for participating in the breakout rooms. One is to participate in a spoken breakout room, and the other option is to do a written breakout room. And that just means that everyone can participate regardless of their uh, particular circumstances. Um, so... What I will ask quickly is everyone who's here at the moment, if you could just edit your Zoom name and tell us what you prefer, the written or the spoken. The way that we normally do this, um, for me, I click on my name in the participants window and then I click rename. And at the very front, I, I want a written breakout room today. So I put W in front of my name to say it's written. Or if you prefer spoken, would ask for you to add S in front instead. Mariana, I'm sorry to hear you're having Zoom issues. Um, keep reconnecting and we'll try maybe and put you as the first speaker if we weren't already. Uh, we, uh, we were. Uh, so hopefully that um, we'll just do our best to persevere. But if there's anything we can do to help out. Uh, oh, man, I think we just lost her again. <laughs> Okay, this could be interesting. Oh no, are you there? You are there. Okay, I I, I think I you think put your camera here. on. Yeah. Uh, so we're yes. not quite at the talk yet. We've got one or two more things yet, but hope, hopefully you can you can persevere and we won't lose you. But yeah, we'll see how it goes. Uh, was there anything else I wanted to do in the introductions? Ah, one one more reminder before we kick off, which is code of conduct. Um. Be cool, folks. Be be nice to one another. Treat one another with the respect that you would like to receive when participating in our community. Um, and if at any point you feel like you witness or experience anything not in line with the code of conduct, which is, of course, a bit longer than be awesome, although I think that does boil down to the spirit of it, uh, you can report that so that we can try and deal with it and make sure it doesn't happen again. So the link to the code of conduct itself is in our ether paired line 62. Um, and the way to report it, use team at openlifesci.org, the email address, to report anything you might need to do. Or if it's regarding an individual who receives the team at openlifesci address, then you can also actually email an individual instead to say, hey, yo was pretty awful on this call, so can you please handle it? Um, hopefully there won't be any need to, to do that today, but if there is, please make use of it. That's why it's here. Uh, I think I've done all the other introductions. Thank you everyone for your beautiful, beautiful icebreakers. Um, so I have one slide to share with you today, just to talk about what the call is going to be about. And I'm waiting for it to load. Okay. Share screen. This one. Don't judge my many tabs. All right. Um, so yeah, today we're talking about open source software and practice, and we have uh, three different experts who will share with you some of the things that they know about open source software. So we're quite excited um, to have you here today and to have these three experts. Uh, so um, if you're looking at the journey of OLS, we're now on week 11. This is a skill up call uh, that is sort of uh, pink. I think if I hold my mouse that you can probably see uh, we're over here. We're most of the way through this cohort of training. 
Um, and we still have a little bit talking about mental health, personal ecology, some open science and some community management before we go to the graduation. Uh, but we have done more than we have not done, which is pretty exciting when you're on round eight of this training. Uh, today, what we'll be covering um, is talking a little bit about good coding practices, reviewing code and what that means. We talk about uh, some package management and preparing your codes to be open. Um, so hopefully you'll feel like you can address those a little bit more than you could um, at the end of the session. No, I've worded that badly. Hopefully by the end of the session, you will be able to address these. <laughs> um, I will um, talk more specifically the three, the three items that we have for the current cohort, good coding practices, code review and package management. But some of the other topics that we I mentioned earlier are also available in our Open Seeds video library. Um, that is available on the website. I think if you go to the navigation from openlifestyle.org, click on Open Seeds and hunt for the video library, you can find it there. That is, ooh, library says no. <laughs> we'll fix that link. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing, uh, stop making embarrassing mistakes and pass over to our very first speaker, Mariana. I hope you're, um, actually wait, Sharon is doing the introductions. Uh, who's doing introductions? Is it, is it you, I, Mariana? I, yeah, yeah I okay, can do this I will one. pass the baton um, to you before I get even more stuck. Thank you, Joe, and thank you for introducing the session today. So our first speaker is Mariana Gomez, and she will be talking about good coding practices. Um, so I will let Mariana introduce herself. Uh, but Mariana, um, are you ready to share your screen and present? Yes, we can. We can see your presentation now. Yeah. Okay. So, can you see my screen? Yeah. And yes. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to introduce myself along the talk. Uh, hopefully it's okay. <laughs> so what is good code for me? I think depends on the scope, the context, and the lifetime of the code. So I found this uh, reference from Roddy Green. And let me know on the, on the chat if you agree with this. So it says, in the interest of creating employment opportunities in the Java programming field, Follow all these rules religiously, and you will even guarantee yourself a lifetime of employment since no one but you has a hope in help of maintaining the code. Uh, warning is just uh, humorous and satirical, right? Um, so let's check what are all those rules. For example, names for baby. Buy yourself a, a, a copy of a, a baby naming book and you will never be uh, anything else for variable names. Use misleading names. Make sure that every method does a little bit more or less than its name suggests. Uh, use single letter variable names. Uh, randomly ca capitalize the first letter of a syllable in the middle of a word. No? So it, this is like uh, satiric because obviously all this um, uh, rules will uh, give you a totally unmaintainable code. So uh, I, I don't think that's the purpose of this group of people in, in this community. So uh, that's something I, I like from Simon Sinek, which is think always about what is the uh, what is what the reason why you are doing what you are doing, no? How, but most uh, important, why? So what I'm doing, so I'm a PhD student in hydrogeophysics. That's what I'm doing. And how, well, I'm trying to combine geophysical methods, specifically uh, electrical methods uh, with hydrological data. And why? Well, that's that's more important. And why I'm doing this and why is open source uh, important for me? Well, I will explain to you later. But in the context of the why is important for me, I consider uh, these four um, aspects of code as a good code. So it is clean code that can be testable uh, and therefore maintainable 
And if the code is maintainable, then it can be extendable. And in all this process, the word refactoring is super important. And if you are not familiar with that word, I highly recommend you the, this talk about what is good code, smells and refactoring from previous OLS talks. Uh, here you have the, the, the links and those are amazing. And, um, but from my uh, talk, I want to take this perspective, the perspective of the good practices I have learned in the communities. And the communities, I, I am a member, an active member. So these are my communities, no? The most important. And this is my institution where I'm doing my PhD. Um, but Geolatinas and Fateando a Terra and Climate Match Academy um, are the, the ones I want to share with you today. So, um, um, so good coding practices can uh, help you to move from a script to something that is installable. Now that software that you can install and easily share. Um, so I, I will explain to you how these different communities have helped me to understand a little bit of this. So in Jonathan's, I, I start here with a learning coding in 2020. Um, so, but from this community, what I have learned is that it's super important to have coding and accountability hours. So we did was to have fixed hours to work together and uh, fostering this uh, feeling of stronger together and creating a positive learning environment for learning and always remind, remind, remember that diversity in skills and unity in team is, is the way to work and progress. No? And now in Climate Match Academy, Climate Match Academy is an organization uh, that uh, strives to democratize climate science. And what we do in this community is create tutorials. We don't create software ourselves. So we take software that is already there and we create tutorials target to, uh, to teach computational tools for climate science. So here I have learned about how using tools like Jupyter Books can be uh, something nice to put together a lot of documentation and notebooks. And yeah, that's super amazing. But also I have the opportunity to interact with people. And then this uh, show me how you have to think on the, on the analysis you want to do with the databases and the decisions you need to take after with this data. And I'm not talking about the climate data, I'm talking about the students data. And I know several of your projects are, are thinking about collecting um, data from people, right? So you, you in this third point, I'm talking like don't subestimate creativity of people. For example, um, in Climate Match, we have this process of application when we ask for GitHub, emails, um, Discord, and we never think about all the possibilities that people uh, can fill this information. No? Like uh, they use three different emails for one for GitHub, one for the platform. But so it was kind of a messy. So um, it's always important to keep in mind what are you going to do with this data so you can plan accordingly and generate your code and prevent these issues, no? And then also I learned how to use, uh, how to think about who is going to use your code. It's not the same to develop code that is going to be used, I don't know, in the United States with people with 150 megabytes per second in internet velocity than someone that has 0 0.5 megabytes per second. So we, we discovered this and we try our best to create different options so they can run the code in these different uh, settings. No? And also uh, a bit of uh, educational materials. And I almost lost all my time. So I'm going to jump to one of my favorite examples that happened recently in the, the Fateando community. So 
it happened in October 13. And what happened is this uh, platform called Zenodo, I, maybe you have uh, hear about it. It's, um, I mean, they, they had a, a, a change in the platform, right? And in fact, then we create packages for different for different purposes. And one of those packages uh, were affected by this update on Zenodo. So yeah, they, they announced the new uh, launching with the stars and everything, everyone was happy. But then on October 16, someone of the community report the error. Like dream, 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 something is going on, we cannot work anymore with Podge in these um, um, situations. And because uh, we have a proper guideline to report errors, uh, well, the error was reproduced and we checked that actually this uh, error was happening. And then on October 24, the, there was a new release with the fix for this bug, right? So you, you can see here all the, all the um, drama history here on this link. And if you take a close um, look on the issue, or, or I mean the pull request that fixed this issue, uh, you can see all these things that I'm talking about, the refactoring steps. Uh, in the middle of the refactoring steps, there was a community call when we discussed like, uh, you know, maybe this, this first step would fix the bug is not the best. So we need to go back and maybe uh, present this other option. So that happened in this another time. And then uh, Santiago run the PyTest, run this is to ensure uh, good styling. Also, super important keep their uh, progress on the uh, on the code, right? So this is just uh, me making jokes. Well, not me. This is copy paste from Senado, which, which says that that Friday the 13th, because it was a Friday, is it was not a good day to to release a a, a major change on the platform right so um this is me <laughs> this is where i'm living when i'm uh, transmitting this uh, talk and i'm happy to to share more and if you want to more about the slides i jump and uh, uh, we can discuss this on the questions and that's it i think i cover everything in it <laughs> Thank you, Mariana. That was just in time. Um, can we give a round of applause for Mariana, please? Um, and you can share your questions for Mariana in line 97 of the Etherpad. I put a link on the chat. And I will start reading this um, note from Joe in, in the chat. Um, Mariana, can you give us a short explanation of what is refactoring? I remember that in the first the slides of your presentation, you mentioned refactoring is um, very important through all of these steps um, to make sure that code, um, that you're following good coding practices. Um, so what is refactoring? What is refactoring? Yeah, that's a nice word I learned in Fatiando. And the way I can explain is like the, the changes that you need to do in order to improve the quality of the code. It's a little bit circular, my definition, but um, for example, if the um, a style is not the, I mean, if you are not using the proper indentation, if you are using uh, names of variables that are not um, clear what, what you mean, or they are not informative, if you are using um, uh, or you're creating a function that it's not just for one purpose, but several purposes, all those um, it's, are not like mistakes or books like, like that, because your code is going to run anyway, but it's not, uh, the, it's not best practices in terms of uh, testable the code or maintain the code or have a clean code. So, Refactoring is you identify those issues and then you change, you adapt, and you improve the code to um, to achieve all this uh, good quality of the code you want to share. 
I hope it's kind of clear. And uh, and more in deep the explanation, you can ch check the uh, uh, Janina Janina talk. Thank you. Are there any more questions for Mariana? I think we have time for one more. Okay, I, I do have one question. And I really like that you started the presentation saying that um, good coding practices are very contextual. So they depend on the context um, for which you are developing code. And my question is, um, can you give us an example of one coding practice that could be um, like necessary to implement or that would be a good coding practices in a community that is just a starting versus one that is um, that has a lot more experience, like how would that change? Mm -hmm. Well, for example, in climate match, as far as I know, all the uh, material we developed, which is, was educational, we test the we test the material. I mean, we give the material to a pool of uh, scientists to analyze and check if the code was. Um, creating the outputs that we said we, we want to create, but we didn't run a proper like Python test tools to, 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 to test the code because we were using code already exists. But in fact, Yando, because we are creating new software, uh, software that you are going to download like NumPy or Pandas, uh, so it's important this code is tested. So in fact, in the GitHub, that's what I was showing you on the on the last slides, there is um, an integration of these tests automatically on the on the GitHub. So you cannot um, submit a, a pull request or you cannot merge code on the on the on the main branch. If this code is not tested, if this code doesn't follow the style, uh, the style rules, and um, and that this is because it's brand new software, and because we want to keep the compati com compatibility uh, backwards and forward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's why uh, I said depends on the context, depends on the scope. Well, thank you so much. That was a very um, nice example. And I am now going to hand it over to um, Seon to uh, present the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you very much, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Your yeah, can clear. you hear me? Yeah, good, good, good. So thank you, Irene, for introducing me. So um, today we'll be having um, River Quiroga. Sorry if I didn't pronounce that name so well. So River Quiroga will be talking to us around code review. And, and I really think this is um, one important aspect of talking about reproducibility science. So she'll be having a few minutes to talk to us around that. And then we can just drop your notes. And if you have questions for her, you can just drop it on the, uh, on the notes part. So we'll just take it after our section. Miss River. Please kindly move ahead. Okay, so hello everyone, and uh, thank you for having me here. Um, yes, I'm going to be talking about code review. Um, I'm going to introduce my name for my, myself first. My name is Riva. Um, I'm part of the OLS community since cohort seven. That means early this year. Um, I've been participating as a mentor. Uh, I have a back background in linguistics, and I say that because um, I think the way I see coding and coding practices are very framed in this idea of this is language and these are people interacting. So this is my way of looking things. 
Um, and I, I also I do a lot of stuff, but one of those stuff that I do is that I'm part of a programming historians team. This is a project uh, where we published uh, open peer review tutorials for people in the humanities and the social sciences to learn about computational tools. So this we do everything in the open. We do open peer review. So I have some experience with open peer uh, review in terms of text, but also in terms of uh, coding. So let's talk a little bit about uh, code review. Uh, what is code review and what are some good practices that we can uh, take into account? So we, we usually talk about code review as part of the process of ensuring code quality. So making our code uh, to be great. There are a lot of things that we can do in order to achieve that. One that um, Mariana mentioned is writing tests. So this is interacting with our, our computer. We write code to check our code uh, to ensure that the code um, is do what it is intended to do and it's, behave, it's behaving the way we want it to behave. And we can write tests to, to ensure the quality of our code. And we can also go through a code review process. And a code review process basically is asking someone else to read our code in order to find bugs, things that are not working and also to suggest ways to improve it. So it's, it's not just about fixing things that are, are not um, act, uh, doing what is expected or that are um, giving us some errors. It's also how we can improve what we have. Maybe we, our code works, but there are things that we can do in order to uh, make it better. So what things we usually review when we do a code review, some of them are very related to the good coding practices that Mariana mentioned. Um, for example, we check for code duplication. If sometimes uh, we re this is called dry for do not repeat yourself. Sometimes our code has like parts that are duplicating uh, things, so maybe we can turn that into a function. So we have the code just one time, and then we call that function. For example, um, maybe there are things that we can improve in terms of performance. Maybe we can do our code. Um, maybe consume less resource of the person, of the people's computer, so that will help so, so everyone can use our code without problem. Things like consistency in naming convention, that is also something that Mariana mentioned, are very important. Uh, the usefulness of the comments, are the comments, for example, explaining not only what the code does, but why it's important for the code to do that. The code style, this is also something that uh, you usually um, review when you do a code review. And a lot of other things that, there are a lot of things that can be reviewed when we do code review. But basically the aim is for our code uh, to improve the quality of our code. And as I said before, this involves asking someone and this uh, implies that code review is a social activity. It's a social practice. Uh, it's not like writing tests that is just programming something and asking the computer to review the code. This is a social activity. This is a social practice. And this Im implies two things. So we need to interact with people. And interacting with people can be wonderful. Um, we can learn a lot from other people. Um, communities, if this kind of activities make community uh, go bigger, make our projects um, be more robust. But interact with people can also be scary, um, especially if you are exposing yourself by sharing something you wrote. So these are things that we have to take into account when we plan code review process, when we participate in code review process, and we, when we design the code review process for our projects. And also something important to take into account is that, is that code review can look very different depending on the context. So sometimes we will participate in code review, code review processes that are very well established. And sometimes we participate in code review process where there's no guidelines at all. And we need to be flexible and try to adapt and always be kind so everyone participating can have a good experience. So there are some projects around that have a well-established process and very clear guidelines, and we can learn a lot about them. For example, uh, the Journal of Open Source Software is a space where you can share your code. If your code is related to research software, you can write an article there and you will go through a process that will not only review what you wrote, but also the code you're talking about on your paper. And this uh, they have like a very uh, well-designed process and going through this process will help you 
um, make your code better and also sharing it in a way that other researchers can use it. So these are projects that have uh, very well designed guidelines and process. The same with our OpenSci or by OpenSci. Uh, these are spaces where you can share, for example, if you wrote a library or a package in R or Python for doing some tasks that are relevant for your field, uh, you can submit your package and it will go through a peer, uh, peer review process. And they have these peer review guidelines that are very detailed and clear of what to expect. For example, here, uh, PyOpenSci explain what their, their process will focus. They will check the code quality and style. They will also check other things that are important, like documentation, package usability, and the test you wrote. And as you see, um, they explain how the peer review process works, the timeline, uh, the policies, and there is a code of conduct because we want people to have a good time in this process. And there are also other projects that, for example, libraries or packages. This is the Tidy team. is a team that uh, develop Tidyverse, Tidy models, and all the MLOps packages in the R community. And they receive a lot of contributions from the community, from community members, not only the deposit employers that are the ones keep, uh, developing these packages. And they um, devoted a lot of time in deciding a code review, some code review principles, so people can have a good experience participating. And also the people that work there can manage all the amount of work that involves, for example, receiving um, submissions via pull request, via pull request for people that want to participate. Um, so there are very clear gu guidelines in these projects. There are very big projects. Some of them are devoted to code review. So making your code better so you can publish that code in others, in other, for example, in their platform. Some are these like very big libraries and packages that have guidelines that help people to contribute. So you can start being an open source contributor in these spaces. That's also things that, uh, and we can learn about a lot of, uh, from these projects. There's a lot to, to learn about um, the process they design and also about the guidelines of uh, on how people can participate. So what about implementing a code review process in your own project? So the word review has a lot of possible meanings. And I think this is very important for people to embrace the different meanings that review has and agree on what we're going to understand. Because a review can be something that's about checking or assessing the quality of something. And that's the main focus on many of these uh, review processes. But it also involves that people might receive feedback and can learn about this. So it's very important that um, you think a lot about how you you want to think the code review process in, in, your, in your project. Because for example, the tidy team, um, they're going to check and they're going to assess the code you propose, for example, for fixing a bug, but maybe they will don't have a lot of time to give you feedback. Um, so it's more it's, mo it's going to be um, more focused on checking and assessing than for example, on feedback and learning. And when you're starting a project like the one uh, people usually start here at OLS, having a code review process can be a very good space for uh, receiving feedback and for learning from your peers and from your community. So one good things about one good thing about having code reviews in your project is this is a very way of transfer knowledge between people on your team. So. Usually projects uh, involve people that have a lot of knowledge in some part of what the project do. Some people have a lot of experience in another one. And when you do code review, you have the possibility of transfer this knowledge between people on your project and for, uh, to the community beyond. Because receiving feedback and suggestions is obviously a way to learn. So someone that has more experience in coding can give you feedback and suggestion on how to make your code um, better. But also you can learn a lot about the way other people write code. Maybe you are going to review someone else's code and that person has a lot of more experience than you. Um, that's also a very good way to learn. Some key points to consider when implementing a code review process. So will be, as you expect, you need to have a code of conduct because you have, this is people interacting. Uh, you can use the same one of your project, but it's, it's, it has to be explicit how you expect people to uh, behave themselves in this process. It's important you that you agree on expectations. What will be the scope of the review? What people are going to, what can they expect uh, others to review on their code? That's very important. 
So you can have need to have at least a checklist of what is going to be reviewed. And that's also important because having this checklist help people also to prepare their code. Um, the checklist is a way to highlight what is relevant when you write good code. And also it's important to clarificate, uh, having clear expectations about the speed of the review. Uh, I think if you have ever submitted a paper to a journal, you know, receiving comments like eight months later is not uh, very good for the process. So when you're reviewing code, it's very important to also to set expectations in terms of how long this process is going to take. It's also very important to think about modular reviews the, the same way we think about modular code. So we talk about modular code. Uh, you don't, in, in case like this, you don't want to write like a very big function that is going to solve every problem on your on your project because it's very difficult to maintain. You can do it's very difficult to do code refactoring um, and maintenance. So usually it's the same. Let I I don't you surely have received this kind of feedback like someone sent you what you wrote and has like. 300 comments and it's too much. It's very difficult to um, see what is important when you have all these comments. So it's the same with code review. Um, so you don't want to have like this very big review about all the aspects that your code involved. It's better if you split the process in chunks. So maybe you are reviewing one part of the code first, then the other one, then the other one. So that way people can learn from the process and it's also easier to manage. And in terms of how to um, in what order to review things, uh, always review first code behavior and a structure and leave everything that has to do with style to the last. The style part, it, it can even get automated in some, in some context, but you don't want to review first style. And, and the reason is the same um, as when you write uh, something. So you probably also have been in this situation that you wrote something, you send that to a peer, to your supervisor, whatever. They make you a lot of comments about styling in a paragraph. And in the next review, they say you that uh, you should remove that paragraph. So all the, the effort you put on styling something, it get removed at the end. So that's why you have to solve all the behavioral and structural things of your code. And then when you know it's working, then you move to the styling part. And as I said before, and also Mariana mentioned, some style, some part of the styling review can get automated. And you always want to automate things if it's possible. Obviously, be kind. Uh, you have a code of conduct, uh, but also be kind. Think about how you would like to receive uh, comments about your work and do the same when uh, you are making comments about uh, other people's code. Ask questions if you, um, if you, if you realize something is not clear about the code, maybe instead of uh, making an affirmation about what you think the person was doing, maybe ask questions. That's a nicer way to interact. And if you're reviewing, offer suggestions and alternatives. Uh, obviously, code review is about finding problems in the code and making, and making suggestions to make it better. But if you find a problem, saying there is a problem, sometimes it's not enough. Um, maybe you can make a suggestion or show some alternatives to tackle that problem and that will make all the process easier. And if you're receiving a review, always thank to the reviewers. These processes are always done by people that are volunteer. Uh, there are many, there are little cases of people being paid for being a reviewer. So they're donating your time to make your code better. So that's always something that uh, we, we need to be grateful. So uh, to finish, always remember that code review is a social activity, it's a social practice, and all the things that we know about how we want to interact with others, how we want our projects to be successful, and our community grows. Um, th those are things that we can consider when doing code review because these are um, sensitive process where we are sharing something we made with others, and we want um, to this to be a very good experience for everyone that is participating. So thank you very much. And in the slides, I share the link. At the end are some of the resources that I mentioned if you want to go there and look them with more detail. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you very much, um, Rava. 
I don't know if I get the pronunciation of your name, but anyway, I think you will do well with that. Yeah, thank you so much, Rava, for, for the presentation. It was such a wonderful one. Really, really awesome. You know, you got to talk about review. Generally, the reviewing process, be it code um, or anything that tries to promote open science and open source, it has really, really been a problem in the body, um, in the body of science in general, you know. Um, this kind of comment that makes you when you read it and you feel so weird and sick that what after several hours of work several months of work and get a comment and you feel so down so it's good it's a good one so do we have any question do anybody has any question for um river for river rather yeah so we just take one or two questions for river So you, you, you can please um, drop it on the notes pad. It'll be there to just read it out. Wow, we have some good, good comments here. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, we, we have a question from Dr. Yoshi said, I love the way you used font size alone to convey that code review can be a great, can be great or scary. Nice one. Oh, sorry, it wasn't a question rather. <laughs> so she was actually was commenting to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was it, it wasn't a question rather. Okay, we have a question. Oh, we couldn't get the person's name, but the person is writing that. What would you recommend? What would you recommend someone who is shy? Okay, what would you recommend someone who is shy to start making code reviews? Or, or rather, the person would love to say, would you recommend somebody who's shy to start making code reviews? Um, code reviews, can there be an anonymous way for reviewing codes without having to put in name, your your identifiers there? River, do you have, do you have an answer to that? Yeah. Um, so one of the idea of open source and open uh, things is that uh, you don't have anonymous reviews. Um, I think we, ha we have all some, if you have, in the academic world, you have experienced what uh, anonymous uh, reviews can lead to. And my experience in the programming historian is that uh, we not only have an open peer review, but in the like in the credits of who wrote the tutorials, reviewers are like openly shown. Is that openness sometimes uh, can be better for introverts and for shy people. So I'm not shy, but I'm an introvert. So for me, it's very difficult to start like um, interacting with people I don't know. And I realized that at least for me, it was very helpful. Um, for example, I start contributing to programming history and reviewing a lesson. And for me, it was very helpful that uh, there were clear guidelines that it was like clearly stated how I, I was expected to interact. And in the other one of you being, your code being like um, exposed in a code review, obviously you can start this with people you know, uh, maybe inside of your project, start a code review process with people that you, um, with whom you feel comfortable working to. And also something to, and if you want to start like contributing like in the broader open sourcing, um, there are a lot of projects that uh, put a tag that is like good for beginners, for example, when they want some, um, they have issues in their code. And some of these issues are related, very small fix that the code needs, that it's a very good start uh, for people that haven't contributed to open source before. So first time contributor or that these kind of tags are a thing that you can look at in GitHub. And that way you can have the experience of being through a code review that doesn't expose like 200 line of code, maybe it's just one line of code that you have to fix there. And it can give you a sense of what to expect. So you can start little or start with people you know, um, or participate in projects where there's a, there are clear guidelines uh, in terms of how to get involved in a code review. Thank you so much, Reva. Uh, poor Sheldon seems to be having some internet uh, issues. I think he heard half the answer and then he just dropped again. Um, <laughs> actually, some really good answers. I especially like the idea of, you know, um, try something little because if people are saying, here's the quick, the easy, the small thing that I want you to work on, and they're already saying, I recognize this is for a newbie and I'm go hopefully going to treat you gently. Um, 
which I mean, given we have like uh, Git is literally named after Linus, Linus Torvalds, right? Um, and Git also in English is a word for someone who's not very nice. It was named after him for a reason, even though he chose that name himself. Um, open source can be scary and um, mm. identifying the friendly ones is a good choice. Aseon, I see you're back. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sorry. I don't know why I'm having issues with my Zoom. It's just dropping in and I'm dropping out, but I think I'm trying to fix it right now. So thank you so much, Trevor, for the for the beautiful time. I would have loved to ask you a question, but I think I'm pretty out of time. So um, let's quickly move into our breakout sections. Wow, I love breakout sections. So um, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be kicking you into um, different courts, um groups now. So we'll be having teams whereby you can either speak or talk. And once you get into it, to we'll be sharing a particular question. We want you to just um, talk around for the next um, 15 minutes. So we'll be having a court of about three to four people in a room. In a room. And here is the question. So think about a bug you encounter in a scientific tool, either as a writer or as a user, or let's say now, or as a reviewer. Uh, was this software code open? And if not, could openness, openness of this particular code make a difference? So we, we, want to hear, we want to hear your thoughts. Just kindly put down your names and your notes from it, either in written or spoken format in the notes part. So um, I think Erin should start kicking people into their teams now. I should start kicking people into their teams now. And I think that's the next thing that we do. So just wait for a few minutes. Oh, oh, thank you, River. Thank you, River, for joining in. We really love to have you around. Um, yeah, so gonna... I already opened. Yeah, I would. I would. So, um, welcome back. Yeah, I, I, we, we, okay, we kind of understand that you, you guys would have, have a lot of beautiful discussions around code review. We had, um, we had some over here alongside Dr. Yo sharing us beautiful insights on our work around code days and stuff like that. And me also um, dropping stuff around that. So we believe that you must have interacted with each other. Then um, in the discussion, we move forward from there. We learn from each other. Then we move ahead. So on to the next is we'll be moving to the last sec uh, second to the last section or the last last section, which is about package management. So for this particular talk, we'll be having a 15-minute discussion by um, Ms. Ruth Njala. And Ms. Ruth Njala, funny enough, is somebody I think I've known from afar. And um, I'm currently in one of our stuff that she's working with. Maybe she, maybe she doesn't know. Um, I think she's working on um, African African society in Oxford or stuff around that the mentorship scheme. So I'm part of the the cohort for now. So I think she'll be very surprised to hear that. So uh, Miss Ruth, um, you have the time till. Wow, great. So so Miss Ruth. Please, you can just go ahead with your discussion. And it would be so nice to hear from you. Perfect. Uh, can you hear me? Great. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Manjala Ruth. Yes, I'm we can. Please move ahead. Okay. Um, so, I'm Ruth. I'm currently doing a PhD in molecular medicine at uh, Oxford. I'm also a carpentry instructor, a certified carpentry instructor, sorry. And I'm involved in teaching carpentry lessons um, globally. I'm also part of the Bioinformatics Hub of Kenya initiative. Um, and if you haven't heard about it, this is your time to go and Google <laughs> and find out the amazing work we are doing in Kenya. And I'm also the founder for my science journey as well. You can check that out on Twitter. Uh, so I'm going to talk about package management. Uh, I have background in bioinformatics and also expertise in uh, package management, having sort of dealt, dealt with uh, this kind of work uh, in the past few years. Uh, so I'll just start by giving a brief overview. So if you think about uh, exploring and chartered mountain ranges, so say you're going for a hike and you're going for a hike in a place that 
you haven't uh, been to before, you probably need to pack a portable tent because you're not sure where or which place is like sort of suitable for that uh, for for a tent, right? So you need something that you can easily move from point A to point B. So similarly, if you think about a data science uh, programming pro uh, project, it is it is wise if you evaluate the effort that you need before actually starting the the project. So you need to figure out okay, what sort of software, what sort of uh, packages do I need for this particular project and how can I sort of put them together so that when I want to sort of run this, this same uh, kind of analysis or this same kind of research, I don't have to start again from, from square zero. So you need to sort of have a container or like a, a manager that would help you uh, move your uh, use your software easily and also someone else would also like to use your uh, software so that's what i'm going to talk about today uh, and if you think about software uh, development and the dependencies that come with it most softwares usually have very complicated dependencies and some of them are sort of like or depend on different operating systems so whether it's uh, Mac OS, whether it's Linux, whether it's Windows. So it could be a pain in the neck trying to install different softwares on different operating systems. And this sort of pie chart here just shows, it's, a, it's from a paper that has been published before, and it just shows the statistics from uh, software installation. So like 51% uh, softwares are easy to install, 27% haven't been installed, 21% are complex to install, and if you do like an installation test, 42% pass the test, 50, 57 will fail. So if you think about what most people use to install software, so things like apt, yam, or pipe, they are cool, yeah? But like not, not most software can be installed using either of these uh, sort of software. So how, how do you go about package management and installing software? So uh, that's what, I, what we are going to look at in the next uh, few slides. So that's where the package manager comes in place. The package managers, they help to handle installations and dependencies where you just have a code and then it will install all the programs and the dependencies that come together with that particular tool or software that you want to install. It also allows for multiple independent environments so you don't have to uh have the headache of okay this software works on this environment but it doesn't work on this other environment and this, on things like that sorry also easily configurable uh, allow for man manual installs as well it can run on all uh, major operating systems so it can run on windows mac os and run on linux as well open source uh, which is what we emphasize on on this entire uh, project and then you can also package your own sort of uh, uh, softwares and tools and contribute to projects. They are also isolated from the operating system, so they are not tied to it. And of course, portability as well. So here I just give a few examples of package managers, but of course there are several that you could use. Uh, the ones that I've personally used are Docker Singularity and Conda. And this sort of help or optimize uh, your packages so you don't have to deal with a dependency headache for subsequent uh, projects. So starting with Conda, Conda is, is I, I think I've mentioned this already, it's an open source package manager. It's independent of the programming language, so meaning you can use it on any programming languages, whether it's Java, Python, Bash, anything. You can use Conda. Uh, also, it's not dependent on an operating system. It's very easy to install it, and you also do not require root access, which is something that sort of limits uh, uh, software installations for most uh, most softwares. And then uh, just talking a bit about Docker. Docker is a platform that is also used for building and running applications in isolated containers. Uh, and it also helps with reproducibility and deployment. So the way Docker works is that uh, you have to build an image and then use that image to run the container. So think about a container in terms of you just have a normal container like this one here, and then it has water. So for this case, 
your container is the docker and then inside this container you have all your tools that you need so that's how containers operate so that in case you want to maybe run this program in project you just pick that single container and use that for your entire analysis so you don't have to sort of isolate your softwares separately so uh, the containers they use images uh, i won't go deeper into that but i have attached references to the end of this uh, powerpoint so you can you can dig deeper and understand also carpentry has a lot has a few sort of uh, lessons that you could look at that also explain how to use Docker and things like that. But generally, uh, there is a Docker Hub, which is like a central registry for images. So you can just go to Docker Hub, get an image, and then use that image to run a container and then use that for your uh, research project. But then other than Docker Hub, there's, an, there's other uh, central registries like the Quay registry. So the advantage if you compare Docker with other virtual machines, I'm not sure whether you've heard about VirtualBox, uh, VMware, OpenStack. If you compare it to those virtual machines, because what most people tend to do is to use virtual machines for uh, carrying their software or carrying their tools that they need for a particular project. So if you compare this to that, it's uh, the virtual machines are usually resource heavy. So sometimes when you're using them, you're either told, okay, you need an operating system that has this amount of RAM or this amount of memory, or you need to just like literally run. If you are running Windows, you need to totally switch to uh, Ubuntu so that you can uh, maximize or minimize your space and things like that. So virtual machines tend to use a lot of resources, but then Docker in contrast is lightweight, so it, it doesn't occupy it doesn't take space from your host machine. So you can easily move it around from one place to the other without having problems to do with like memory and RAM uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's Docker. And then there's the other one, which is Singularity. Singularity is also another container platform. It works similar to Docker uh, based on a user perspective because you could either use Docker or Singularity. But based on the architecture of the system, it is fundamentally different. And what happens is that when you're working on a cluster or a server, uh, they normally recommend or they normally use Singularity as opposed to Docker because Singularity is sort of more secure than Docker. So you'd realize if you're working, if you're working on your own personal machine, you can use Docker to package your tools. But if you're working on the cloud or on a cluster, you would need to use Singularity. So what most people do is because, is, uh, because it's easier to install or to build a Docker image, they normally build the Docker image and then use Singularity to run the, the Docker image. So they have a Singularity container, but the container is made from the Docker image. But this is just like a uh, concept that you can get once you start running these uh, containers. So the advantage that Singularity has over uh, other containers is, I have mentioned security, so it has verifiable reproducibility and security, and that's why most servers or clusters would use it. Uh, also, it easily makes use of GPUs, high-speed networks, and things like that. And also, it's, there is a single file container that Singularity uses, which is easy to transport and share as opposed to a uh, Docker container. So uh, if you want to learn more about uh, these containers and uh, about Conda, I have attached a couple of references and further materials here. So if you click on each of them, you'll be able to like grasp what uh, they talk about. I've also done uh, a couple of tutorials that I can also share with the team here. Uh, and I, I can also share the carpentry materials as well if you're interested. But generally, uh, using either of these package managers helps with uh, reproducibility and dealing with uh, the dependency hell because once you have a Docker container, you can easily uh, use send it to someone else to use it. And you can also use it as well for in future when you're done with that project and maybe you want to come back to it. So you don't need to sort of switch 
for instance, if now we are using 5 and 3.7, and in the next five years, we'll be having maybe 5 and 6.4, something like that. If you have your container that still has 5 and 3.7, that was working with your uh, software that you've built, then it means even in the next five years, you can still use that container that has the Python 3.7 to still run your project. You don't need to start rewriting um, or writing new code to run your softwares with Python 6.7, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, yes, that's it, and I'll take questions. Yeah, in. Um, yeah, thank you so much, um, Ishrut. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, thank you so much for sharing your work with those around um, project management, um, the use of, um, <clears throat> um, um, rather, um, the use of um, Conda, Singularity, and then um, Docker images. It's, 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 it's really mind blowing to find out that um, the, these have been the latest technologies, the singularity technology has been the latest technology in bioinformatics. And actually I'm trying to get my whole hands around it. So as to say, I to for, uh, probably increase the efficiency around that analysis and it was stuff like that. So it's good one. So do we have anyone who has um, questions, <coughs> questions around this? Do we have anyone who has a question or if kind of drop it in the, um, in the notepad so we could just take it from, from there? There's a nice one in the etherpad, actually. Uh, don't read mine, read the green one. <laughs> I could not find any question on an eater, but I don't know. Maybe, my maybe, maybe yours is disconnected. Um, I'll quickly read it. Uh, so we have someone saying, what would the main differences between a Conda environment and Docker containers be using the tent analogy? And I did love the tent analogy, by the way. So useful. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the tent analogy is, uh, but just to explain the differences between a Conda environment and a Docker container, they actually work in sort of a similar manner, um, only that with the Docker container, you need an image first before you actually run the container. And then you can, we have recently we have the M1 and M2 chip, and Docker has sort of started having issues with uh, M1 and the M2 chip on Mac OS. So with Docker, sorry, Conda, um, Conda has issues with uh, Mac M1 and M2 chip. But if you're using Docker, then it means you can still run it on M1 and, or M2 Mac OS. But generally, they work in similar manner because both of them, you just have, it's sort of like uh, a bottle, like I mentioned <laughs> previously. And then you have your tools inside. So for the for the Conda environment, you just need to activate that environment, which is like you just basically need to open your bottle and then get the contents of that bottle. And similar to Docker container, you need to run the Docker image for you to access uh, the container. So they sort of work in a similar manner, but they have a few advantages here and there, uh, depending on the system that you're working on and depending on uh, the feasibility of your service in that system. Yeah, I don't know how to map it back to the, <laughs> the what is it called? Uh, you, you mentioned at the start of your talk about portable oh, tents. Oh, virtual analogy. Okay, I know, oh, wait. Oh, okay. So yo, yo, I think I missed your, I misunderstood your question. So now reading it, it makes sense. Okay, what would be the main difference using the bottle? Okay, so using this. <laughs> okay, I think I've explained that. Um, then what else? I love the comparison of a software package being like a portable tent. May I borrow that description for the future? Yeah. Um, could you describe what root access means? So. Root access means uh, when you're trying to install tools, 
it's usually asked for a sudo password if you're trying if you're installing tools on your on your machine and when you're working on a cluster or a server then you do not have sudo access because the sudo access is managed by your organization or like the admin of your institution or organization wherever you are so you do not have admin privileges but if you if you have admin privileges then it means you have root access so meaning you can delete anything and everything as much as you want or install anything and everything as much as you want but if you have no root access then it means you are limited to what you can install what you can delete and things like that because they are all managed by someone else I hope that makes sense. Yeah. That's uh, really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm just going to grab control of the mic, I think, if that's okay, and just wrap up. Uh, so can we have one final round of applause for our fantastic speakers today? Thank you so much, folks. Um, I actually learned a bunch and uh, you can tell that I haven't been coding regularly for a few years when you start seeing stuff. Like, oh, I didn't know that had happened. <laughs> um, so, uh, Sean, we're getting a lot of wind coming through, so I'm just going to mute you if that's okay. Sorry. Um, perfect. Yeah, um, it's some really, really interesting talks. Uh, sometimes we also get follow up questions on YouTube later on. Uh, so this should be on YouTube in, um, I don't know, a few days, usually no more than a week. Um, and what do we have to follow up? Ah, if you are a cohort participant, um, have you filled the cohort survey? Thank you. I'm guessing Irene for adding that in because I know that wasn't there earlier. Well done. Um, please do fill out the mid-cohort survey. Uh, feedback is the best way for us to improve and iterate on what we're doing. Um, and there's a reminder for that in the chat and also in the RLS Slack uh, as well for cohort eight. Um, folks, if anyone has any questions um, or any feedback that you would like to share, the Etherpad always has open feedback um, about things that surprised you, things that you might want to change uh, and so on. And um, we are always happy to hear it. So yeah, feedback, 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 whether it's mid cohort or whether it's just for this call. Um, anything that anyone else would like to add? Shall we wrap up? Okay, it's echoing silence. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Ayo, for standing in for me. Thank you, Ms. Um, Ruth, for coming in and talking about your project around um, talking about singularity, doctor technology, and you and thank to all our um thank you to all our um speakers for coming through. I think Mariana had a comment. <laughs> Yeah, Hi. Mariana? Yeah, can I talk? Uh, okay. Can, you yeah. can. Please go ahead. Uh, well, I just want to apologize for my problems with Zoom. And I want to say thank you for the invitation. It was a really surprise. And I, I, I love to be here. It was an honor. I hope Irene is not upset with me. <laughs> and it was super nice to talk with Ruth. And to listen to the talk with Riva. Thank you so much. And you are doing a great job. And I'm be sure to share these resources with my communities, the communities I am involved. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mariana. I think we were blown away by the obvious careful research that you'd put into your talk, um, which made it super cool. I was like, wow, you have recommendations for all the other related talks that people can look at. It was really good. And I definitely laughed at the jokes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Sean, anything else that you wanted to add to wrap up or are we good? Yeah, we're good to go. So bye, everyone. Thank you for joining in. Stay put, stay connected to OLS, and let's keep pushing up the frontiers for open science all around the world.
Those are the most beautiful words by lovely humans. I'm going to end that call.